And now, a uh, very special presentation by, uh, by, by Jack, our mayor, Jack Seiler, being introduced by his dad, our very own honorary Pete. Thank, thank you, Bill, and a great thank you to John Floyd. Holy cow, without him, this would not have been possible. Uh, Doug Timmy, I'm glad to see that Dale Carney, of course, did such a great job with you. It's fantastic. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And um, you know, when you when you're growing up and you got kids, you wonder what they're going to be. And and we got five kids. Jack has an older brother and has uh, three younger sisters. Uh, he was born in Colorado. He grew up in Fort Lauderdale. And so I thought I'd do a little program on what will I be. So we'll go into this and see what's going to happen. This is Jack many many years ago, and I watched him one day, and I said. God, maybe he's going to go into the boat business and own a boat one day. And I said, that'd be fantastic. And, well, it wasn't too long ago. He gets, a, he gets a, one of these little rafts and he's running around. I said, hey, maybe we make a surfboards. That would be another fantastic thing. And then all of a sudden, oh, my God, he's going to be a bartender. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got a little excited. I said, maybe he's going into the agriculture business, start ra uh, growing a few oranges and grapefruit and there he is climbing up and I looked down below and I said the reason he's doing that is because he's got a young good looking gal below him so yeah <laughs> Jack graduated from St. Anthony's and this is a picture of some of his friends some of you might recognize the second guy that's Dan per Perry and first is Chris Lindson John Tite and then Jack so I was happy at least getting education and he's moving on in the right direction then I looked one day, and we're out, of, we're out traveling around the country, and I look over, and I said, Jack Sale's going to be a policeman, or he's going to jail. I didn't figure out what it was going to be. And then he came to work one day, with, came to my office, and I said, boy, maybe I'll go in my field, be a veterinarian. And here he is helping take care of a dog on the left, and he's doing an x-ray on the right, and he's doing EKG down below. But that didn't work out so well, because uh, he was still undecided like his other brothers and sisters. I knew I didn't really decide what to be into after I got drafted by Uncle Sam, and I knew I didn't want to be a soldier. The, this, this is Jack graduating from Cardinal Gibbons, and he graduated president of the student body. From there, he went on to Notre Dame, he graduated from Notre Dame. He went on then to the University of Miami Law School. And this is a funny picture because after he took his bar exam, he came over and he said, Dad, he said, two of my classmates and I thought we might take a little trip. And I said, well, that'd be good. He said, well, we can't hear about the bar for another six weeks, so we'll, that'll be time we can do something. Next thing I know, I get an envelope in the mail, Kiowa Bear, Jackson, Australia. I said, well, he's going to be a travel guy. He comes home. And he took, he, uh, he passed the bar in Bill's lock, as you can see on the left, and this is when he was sworn in. Then along about this time, about, well, it was about 1989, he starts his own practice. And while he was practicing, he used to play in a girls and boys softball league. And so one day he's out at the park and he sees this good looking gal over on the first base and he keeps looking and she looks back at him and Next thing you know, he says, you know, she's a beautiful girl. Before we know it, that's Susan Rhymes. Remember Jean Rhymes? That's one of his daughters. And they got married. And then Jack wanted to let her know how life was going to be living with him. <laughs> All the time, you're going to have somebody running around, and that's what it was. So he brought a bunch of his Notre Dame buddies down with him. And here's his family. He has four kids. I'll go through each other. This is the oldest. She graduated away from Notre Dame last year. She's now a, this is a little confusing with the football game. She's now in law school at FSU. So I don't know what she did last, the other night. This is his daughter who's a junior at FSU. This is his son Preston at Villanova and he's trying to kick the football for the team. We'll see what happens, he's only a freshman. And this is his younger daughter who's in the, a junior at Cardinal Gibbons. When Jack got home, he, he uh, started practicing, and then he said, you know, he said, I might like to get in a little political action. So 
He ran for council of Wilton Manor and he was elected. So he said, it's so good, maybe I should go ahead and run for the mayor. So they ran for the mayor and he was uh, two years in office. And the next thing you know, it's 2000 and he thought, well, you know, I should really represent the state of Florida and go into the House of Representatives. So between 2000 and 2008, he was in the House of Representatives. And then he came home and he looked around, he talked to his family and talked to everybody. He said, I think I'll run for mayor of Fort Lauderdale. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, what is Jack going to be? Is he going to be a politician? Is he going to be a lawyer? Or is he going to do both? So Jack, Jack runs for mayor. He wins. And he's in his second term of a nine-year, got three three-year terms that you can do as a mayor in Fort Lauderdale, and he's in his second term. He has another term uh, left, and that comes up in March of, night of uh, 2015. I told Jack, I said, if you're going to run again, that's fine. I still got my shirt. I can wear it. I can stand on the corner, and I can wave to everybody and go, great, great, John. Here we are. Jack is very active and very, very busy, you know, and a lot of com committees and he presently is a chairman of the uh, strategic relations committee of the Orange Bowl and also of the athletic division of the Orange Bowl. Jack and his family, we love you, you're doing great and we're very proud of you. And I just want to rep represent, tell you our mayor of Fort Lauderdale, John P. Jack Seiler. I have been looking for every one of those pictures for the last month and I couldn't figure out what happened to him in the house. It's actually the biggest fish I ever caught, fishing with my dad, so. Uh, first of all, good morning to everybody. How we doing? Let me, uh, let me just take a second, to, just two comments. One, I want to single out uh, Kathleen Cannon because to tell you what kind of uh, caliber the, uh, of an organization United Way is and what kind of character she has, um, about three or four months ago, she came to me and said, you know, United Way is looking for a project. We want to do something that's going to have an impact in the community and make a difference. And uh, for those of you that have been to War Memorial Auditorium lately and pulled in, that whole auditorium was actually spruced up as a, as a United Way project. They had volunteers out there, spent a day, did an absolutely awesome job. And I thought, you know, how, how many communities in this country can on the spur of a moment an organization like United Way say, hey, we're going to get some volunteers. And we actually probably had too many volunteers out there that day to work on that facility. It speaks volumes about the United Way and your leadership. So thank you for that. The second thing I want to single out the United Way for, they're working on a project called Mission United. And it's something we are going to need all your help on. We need help here in the community. Probably the biggest challenge we have in Fort Lauderdale is dealing with the homeless. Uh, that has been a, an issue for us since I took office. Uh, we're making tremendous headway. We're really uh, having a, a great success in dealing with them. But the one area of the homeless that's really causing us a lot of heartburn is, is the veterans. When you think about a veteran coming back from the war and a veteran coming back from service, to this country and they come back and they end up on the street and I think there is no excuse for that there should be a, a zero tolerance policy for that if somebody served this country I think we can find it in our hearts and in our community to serve them and so Mission United has stepped up to serve we're working on a number of initiatives with veterans organizations to try to capture the veteran and that's the one group that I think you know a lot of the homeless we deal with it's it's a choice it's a they're chronic they want to be on the street they almost want to be left alone but when it comes to the veteran, I think we, we as a community need to pull together. So I would encourage you all to work with the United Way on that, work with the, the Mission United organization, as well as work with the city as we try to make sure that no veteran ends up homeless on the streets of Fort Lauderdale. And along those lines, the next month, November 11th, will be uh, Veterans Day, as you know. We have two ceremonies in Fort Lauderdale, one out at the cemetery and uh, down off of State Road 84 and one on the river. Uh, no excuse not to take a few minutes and just join us for a veteran ceremony and to thank those that served our country and really allow us to have this great quality of life in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the city, where we are, um, and I'll tell you the first thing where we are. I'm up here looking out at a room that practically built this city. 
I'm looking around, I'm listening to introductions, I'm listening to the individuals, and I'm realizing that, you know what, this isn't about the city of Fort Lauderdale at all. This is about you all. When you think of the Executives Association, the, the legacy, the leadership, the service in this room, uh, you're all thanking me for serving, you're thanking my dad, you're, and I'm listening, I'm looking out. These are, you are the people that day in and day out are, are doing amazing things. Whether it's a charity, whether it's a, uh, an effort to assist in, in the community, whether it's an effort to bring together people. You know, John, I know you, you get up there, you're pretty darn enthusiastic, but I think of how many times you're giving back here and there, and I, it just, and I look around this room and you're all in the same boat. This is who built Fort Lauderdale. What you're gonna see in a few minutes, a little presentation of where we are as a city, it's not because of this city commission. It's because of you all, your families, your kids, your parents, that really kind of made Fort Lauderdale where it is as a community. Um, I want to take a second while I'm here to just uh, give a plug to our city commission. Uh, folks, I am blessed to work with the best city commission anywhere. Give you an idea just of the caliber of the people I'm get a chance to serve with. Uh, my vice mayor is a guy named Romney Rogers. I mean, do you need to say any more? I mean, a leader in the church, leader in the business community, guy gives back. He has for 50 years, he has been active here in Fort Lauderdale, grew up here. Ever since his days at Stranahan High, he has just been a leader in the community. And to have a guy like that as a vice mayor, people say, you know, well, you guys get along so well. I'm like, you know what? If you can't get along with Romney Rogers, there is something wrong with you. He is first class. I think you all know his type of guy he is. Then you go from him to Bruce Roberts. Bruce Roberts serves as the district commissioner for where we are today. Bruce Roberts, for those of you that might remember him in his former career, 35 years on the Fort Lauderdale Police Department. Last six as a chief of police. There I say, you know what, if, if you can manage 512 police officers day in and day out in the politics that take place at the police station, you can certainly manage District 1 in the city of Fort Lauderdale. And Bruce Roberts is that type of guy. He is another outstanding individual to work with. I'm sorry to tell you we're going to lose our, one of the other commissioners, Bobby DeBose. Bobby got elected to the House of Representatives. I told Bobby five years ago when he came in, I said, Bob, I said, you're not stopping here in Fort Lauderdale. Had that exact conversation with him about a month into the job. He says, what do you mean? I said, you got too much uh, energy, too much excitement, too much enthusiasm to stay at this city level for too long. I said, you don't want to burn out. You want to move up. So Bobby ran for the House of Representatives, just got elected by a landslide, and he'll be heading to Tallahassee in November. And I encourage you all as executives, Keep in touch with Bobby. This will be a guy in Tallahassee you can talk to, you can go to, and ask about issues that are going to impact you on a statewide level. Super guy and a super guy to serve with. The last member of our commission, Dean Trantalis. Dean was a guy that uh, actually ran against me the first time I ran for mayor. And everybody said, oh, what's going to happen when he joins you on the commission? Well, I'll tell you what happened. I got a guy in the commission that came with a tremendous amount of experience. A guy that was able to hit the ground running with no learning curve. He'd spent three years on the commission in Fort Lauderdale. And he's an individual that, again, makes my job as mayor easier because he knows how to deal with his district, he knows how to deal with his constituents, and it creates a very nice commission to work with. So the compliments that were paid to where the city's going, as I said, in addition to being paid to you all for what you've done, they really belong to this city commission with four guys that have learned to work well together and have learned to cooperate and collaborate. Um, one heads up, I know there was a little hesitation on that boat show. That is the world's largest boat show that's coming to Fort Lauderdale. It'll be here next week. Uh, I encourage you all to embrace them, welcome them. Give me an idea, you, under, you all understand business. This room, if anybody understands business. Let me know the number that that boat show represents to the city of Fort Lauderdale. It's a half a billion dollars in economic impact. Give me an idea, the last Super Bowl here had about a $330 million economic impact. That annual event brings a half a billion dollars to the greater Fort Lauderdale area. So when traffic gets a little heavy or maybe you have a little longer wait at the 15th Street Fishery for your dinner or your drinks or to try to get a table, just thank that boat show because that, in, that is now the world's largest boat show. There's six locations. There's over $3 billion worth of merchandise. Tell you how significant that boat show is on the, in, on the global scale. Next year, we're moving that boat show back a week. We had a few weather issues. And this last weekend in October have created a couple issues for us, so we decided, well, let's move it back one week. So we move our boat show back one week to get us on a schedule that we want to be on. And every single major boat show in the world, Monte Carlo, 
the Mediterranean, the Hong Kong, all shifted their schedule one week. Imagine that impact throughout the globe in order to line up with our boat show. It sets the table for the rest of the year in the marine industry. That industry is worth about $14 billion here in the, South, in the Florida area and about $10 billion in the greater South Florida area. It's something we need to embrace. So you get a little tied up in traffic or a little frustrated by uh, too many cars on the road or too many pedestrians, just thank them for that half a billion dollars of economic impact and you know, give them a, uh, a full five finger wave, if you will. That would be the most appreciated. Um, <laughs> Let me talk about a couple things before I run through where we are. Uh, first of all, I also want to thank John Floyd for setting that up. John, I don't thank you for what you did for my dad, but thank you for the slide that's coming up here. Um, you know, I, I will take a second to say I, I was blessed to probably be raised by, you guys knew my dad from this organization. Um, I had, uh, I think, the best parents anybody could ever have. And to be able to grow up here in Fort Lauderdale with a mom and dad like I had, and, uh, you know, just no substitute for a family that cares, and parents that care, and they, you know, Talk about I try to get to some softball games here and there and soccer games and events. That's because that's the way my parents raised us. And they were making sure they were there for us when we needed them. So, Dad, thank you. Thank you for your love and support all years. Um, let's just talk about where Fort Lauderdale is. We had, um, what a, we've had some good success lately. And this is, um, again, this is not up here for the commission. This is up here for you guys to get an idea of where we're going as a city. Back in 2009, um, we were in the middle of a pretty deep, uh, what they're calling now, what the Great Recession, I think is the terminology they're using for it. We came in, we were probably operating uh, with about 2,600 employees. We were operating with a budget that was probably out of balance by about um, 25 to $30 million just because of the downturn, property values dropping, uh, permits being down. A lack of activity, sales tax, all those things down, and we had a pretty, pretty big hit we were looking at. And as a city, we had to make a decision back then. We said, you know, are we going to uh, tighten our belt, kind of get lean and mean, or are we going to just try to tax our way out of this issue? And we took the uh, first route. We said we're going to just tighten our belt. As many of you know, we actually reduced the city workforce from when I came in by about 300 employees in the first year, year and a half. We made over uh, about two, almost 300 employees, about 290. We made those cuts without touching public safety. We didn't cut one policeman, we didn't cut one fireman. But we made cuts in a lot of other areas. They were in our building department, they were in our permitting department, they were in public services, public works, parks and rec. And we decided though we had to do that rather than raise taxes because we weren't gonna spend our way through that great recession. And we took a pretty fiscal conservative approach, and I can tell you, I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that the tax rate that we had when we took office back in uh, 09, January of 09, was 4.11. That was the millage rate. Your millage rate today, when you go home and look, you will see it's 4.11. We have never raised the millage rate here in the city of Fort Lauderdale in six years of setting the millage rate. We are now the second lowest property tax rate of the 25 largest cities in the state of Florida. We are now finding out from like the Broward Alliance and the Broward Workshop and even from the Chamber and those groups, that's become a huge recruiting tool. Those of you that may own property in other cities, go look at your property tax rate. If you own property in uh, Lauderdale Lakes, you're probably in the eight or the nine millage. That's twice the property tax you pay in Fort Lauderdale. Miami's in the sevens, Hollywood's in the sevens. We're in 4.11, we think there's a substantial benefit to having that super low tax rate that sends the message two people that you can come here and invest in property and you're not going to get taxed out of that property. So that, that's the one thing we've kept at 4.11. The other thing I will tell you, we recognized when we got hit that we were going to have a huge downturn in some of our key industries. I probably don't need to tell uh, Steve Palmer that the downturn, one of them was going to be in real estate. We all saw it coming. This, this city was founded on three main industries. It was founded on tourism, real estate development, and the marine industry. No matter how you cut it, no matter how you slice it, go back through history. Those three main industries founded Fort Lauderdale. The four main industries for the state of Florida are those three with agriculture, when you look at it. But those three are what we didn't really have a big agricultural impact, except for that one picture of me picking that orange in the side yard of our house. I'm not sure there was much of an agricultural impact here. But we recognize with the downturn in the marine industry and the hit they took, downturn in real estate and development, we had to make sure tourism sustained us. And so I'm pleased to tell you that as of today, we got notified we've had 57 straight months of tourism growth here in the city of Fort Lauderdale. 
So again, an interesting number, and no one else in the state can give you that, 57 straight months of tourism growth. That's not just growth in terms of numbers, it's also growth in terms of the average daily room rate. The last couple of years, that has been back up, and we're really recovering strong. So now the real estate and development is back, tourism has been healthy, and the marine industry is back, looks like in full force. Uh, we've got our three main industries back, and we're starting to focus on a few more to improve. Uh, in addition to that, our unemployment rate, thanks to you all again. I don't know if you realize, but our unemployment right now is the it's lower than Miami-Dade, it's lower than Palm Beach, and it's lower than the state average and lower than the national average. We actually lead all the urban areas in the state of Florida in unemployment rate. And again, that speaks volumes about the executives association, the business community, and that. Uh, how many of you all pulled a permit with the city of Fort Lauderdale in the last year? How many of you thought the experience was a little better than it was five years ago? Well, good, the same number of hands went up. I will, <laughs> if, if that didn't happen, I would have had a little problem. Uh, but in all seriousness, we have shortened the permitting process substantially at the city. Uh, back about the same time frame five years ago, we said, you know what? If we're going to be able to get through this recovery and uh, get back on track, we can't have people losing money in our permitting department. And uh, Steve, I don't know if you were one of the ones that got involved in this. I know we had some Styles reps involved, but we actually did a workshop out at our permitting office and brought in people to focus on everything from permitting, contractors, subcontractors, engineers, design, architects. Sat down with our staff, we told our staff, no one will lose their job over this. But we are going to figure out a way to streamline permitting. So we worked with uh, our own staff, we worked with the workshop, we worked with the um, Broward Alliance. We came out with a permitting process called Platinum Permitting. That passed a few years ago. You now know where your permit is every step of the way. How many of you in the past used to call, well, it's, it's somewhere between electrical and plumbing. Not sure where it is, not sure who was the last guy to touch it, but it's somewhere between electrical and plumbing. Or you get the, uh, well, my, you know, I thought I saw it on Joe's desk on Friday. Let me see where it is. You now go online, you can track your permit through our process. It is amazing what transparency does for people's responsiveness. <laughs> there is nobody that can now hide behind where is a permit and where it is in the process. We did that permitting process and now 18 cities have copied the process we've implemented in the city of Fort Lauderdale. And you're starting to see this throughout Broward because people, would, what happened, they'd walk into Coral Springs and they'd say, well, how come Fort Lauderdale's got their permit out in three days and it's seven days here? And 18 cities have now joined us in platinum permitting. We're pretty excited about that. And then the last thing we've done, and uh, Chris, you mentioned that you, we, you worked on this. We got with the business community early on. We said, folks, we need to help you do business. We need to facilitate business. We don't need to put up roadblocks and obstacles and obstructions to doing business in Fort Lauderdale. And so in addition to the permitting thing, we started working with them on an annual basis on a business first initiative. And they have been unbelievable to work with. But out of that, we have done hundreds of little things in City Hall in terms of creating a business ambassador, creating uh, liaisons that'll work closely with the business community figuring out how to speed the process up and make things happen quicker. And it's again, I think a lot of times in, in, in government, people look at the residential life or the neighborhood life and say, well, that's adverse to business. And I look at it completely different. I think a healthy business community allows you to have a very healthy residential community. A healthy business community allows residential areas to prosper and, and grow and, and, and develop the way we want. And if you have this healthy business community, you realize at the end of the day, it kind of you know, helps the whole community rise up. And we've been very successful with that. So just to give you an idea of where we've ended up, run through this list. This is um, this past summer in Denver, uh, city of Fort Lauderdale got named All-America City. Some of you may have worked on that initiative back uh, in 93. We tried, we were a finalist. We went out to Denver and we were picked as one of the All-America Cities. You now see that on our signs, you see that on our letterhead. It is uh, out of thousands of cities that apply through the process, they only select a couple, and we were named All-America City in Denver. And they, one of the neat things about this was, this was a combination of East and West. This was a combination of all of our socioeconomic backgrounds, all of our diversity. Some of the stuff we emphasized to, to win this was not it was just what was happening downtown, Los Olas, the Riverwalk, but what was happening off of Sistrunk with the revitalization of Sistrunk, what was happening with Orange Bowl Field at Carter Park with the thousands of kids that are using that field in the combination. Then we got ranked top 10 best downtowns. I gotta give a lot of credit to that to Styles. This is a company that uh, 
And I, and I don't just give that shout out lightly because I will tell you something. One of the things about Terry Styles and his organization, when they come to you to work on an issue and they say they're going to do something, they do it. I don't think I've ever had to call Terry or any of his guys back and say, you know, you told us you were going to do that streetscape over there on that side street and it's not done. It's not the way it operates with them. They really do it and they do it well and they do it right and I appreciate that. And now you look at getting rock ranked top 10 best downtowns, top 10 most exciting places in Florida, top 10 most exciting mid-sized cities and top 10 American dream cities. And then this has been something that's been really important to us with the top 10 greenest mid-sized cities. Um, folks, all I got to do is look outside. You look at this intercoastal, you realize even the day it's up. You know, where the numbers we're looking at, and I don't need to get in a debate on global warming, warming or the cause of it, because that's not an issue. The fact is, is that the effect of it is going to impact Fort Lauderdale. We've seen it. How many of you all live off Los Olas Isles? How many of you all seen higher water levels in the last couple of years? We've had to do some things with some new uh, type drains. We've had to do some things with some new uh, stormwater systems, drainage systems. All you have to do is go look at A1A two years ago when we had that washout with the northeast wind coming behind a storm with a hurricane off the coast and a high tide. It, it wiped out our beach. And so we realized then that we've really got to focus on this issue, not on I'll let all the experts debate the cause. I'll let all the people in Washington and Tallahassee fight over that. My thing is, what is the effect and how are we prepared for it? And so we went out and said, we're going to become a resilient city that's focused on climate change, that's focused on rising waters. Everything we do, even we, we rehabbed our whole building department in terms of that. Every new permit we issue, we look at elevations even more so. We, ri we raise up buildings. All of our stormwater systems, all of our drainage systems, all, everything like that is now focused on uh, climate issues. We've got a sustainability advisory board that works closely with us. We're doing things with um, solar panels, with wind. How many of you all saw the wind uh, thing that went on top of the Hilton? Has anybody seen those? That was actually a kind of a pilot project. The city code didn't provide for that. But we thought, well, you know what, if they're going to step up at Hilton and try to be a green hotel chain, we're going to find a way in our city code to allow them to put that up there. That helps power their building now. We put four more out at uh, Mills Pond Park. You see them out there when you're running. But we're now trying to send that message that you can be a very successful city and you can be a green city. And at the end of the day, being environmentally friendly is being economically smart because it's, I think it's going to save us money in the long run. Top 10 best U.S. cities for small businesses. That probably came out of this group, I think. You guys uh, voted on that, maybe. Uh, top 10 best cities to move to. Top 10 small American cities of the future. Top 10 most physically attractive mid-sized cities. This top one is important to us. This is what I was talking about earlier. We want veterans to be able to come here and retire here. Retire not in the streets, but retire in our community, retire with our businesses. We now have a special hiring process for veterans at the city of Fort Lauderdale. If you want to be in our police department or fire department, you get an extra bump if you served in our military. So we actually emphasize hiring veterans. We have found, I, I was with Vernon Clark uh, last Thursday, and we were talking about this, and we find that the veterans we hire understand organizational skills better, discipline, and getting, uh, you know, not only giving orders, but taking orders. It's a process, and I think they're coming out of the military, that helps. So we're pleased with the veterans thing. Uh, the next one is the only one I probably disagree with. I even have a hard time finding parking. I don't know how we got ranked top 10 best cities for parking, but we'll take it. Uh, top 10 great cities but for family vacations. Actually, that nerd wallet, the reason that is is because of all the automated parking things we're doing now where you can start pay by phone, find ways. Uh, I think the, the, the success is going to be when our apps start telling you where are the empty parking spaces, then I think we'll be successful. We're working on something like that now. Top 10 great cities for family vacations, most affordable summer, or 4th of July. Now this, this next one you would look at, because I'm going to just point out the top 10 best places to retire. Money Magazine, that's not a, uh, one to be taken lightly. And you realize, why is this? I mean, for a city that now is ranked top two for young professionals, exciting place to move to, exciting place to live, why is that now one of the top 10 best places to retire? And I'll tell you why. It is not your grandparents' retirement. This city has become a city where most people that retire here are now active. You think of even the, the people that are now seniors in this group, it's an active retirement. It's an active retirement where you want to go to the theater, you want to go to the Museum of Art, Museum of Discovery and Science with the kids and the grandkids. 
It has completely changed the concept of retirement. Retirement used to be, you know, you grab a chair, you sit in a rocker out somewhere, and you just and watch the years go by. Now in Fort Lauderdale, our thought of retirement is how active can you be, how successful can you be, how much interaction can you have with your kids and your grandkids and your neighbors. And that was something we were very excited about when money recognized that. Um, the bottom one is one that uh, we probably need your help on a little bit. We are trying to do this complete streets policy, which combines pedestrian friendliness, bicycle friendliness, and car, you know, auto friendliness. Now you'll notice we, a lot of places we're putting in these bike lanes, we're trying to put them back in, we're doing up and down A1A when we're done, you'll see that. You saw what we did on the Galt Ocean Mile between Oakland and the big wide bike lanes. That's really our long-term goal, is to create pedestrian friendly, bicycle friendly, complete streets, if you will. And uh, sometimes we're, we're ranked number one in Florida with this policy and number three nationally, but I feel so many times our own business community pushes back when it comes to trying to create these complete streets. And we think there's room to do both. There we go. All right, the last couple here, we've got the most popular US beaches. This next one is just like, this was one I'm like, did you really have to put up there? <laughs> I mean, I was speaking to a group over on the Galt, and I put that up there, and I think half the room was Canadian. And they were like, you know, we didn't realize that was even up for discussion. The next one is consistent with what I was telling you earlier, the US Green Building Council, we're now being recognized as the most outstanding green government. And the next one down is important. It's important to me because of the pictures you saw up there. And I think it's important to my dad and my mom because of the pictures you saw up there. You think of my family, my brother moved to Melbourne, he's practicing medicine. My sister's in Atlanta practicing law, my other sister's in Atlanta teaching, and my other sister's in Bloomington. And none of them are coming back to Fort Lauderdale. And you think about your kids and your grandkids, and you know, who's going to come back here? And when you start thinking all of a sudden what's happening with our universities, with Nova and Broward College and Florida Atlantic University, three outstanding universities, and you realize that our kids don't have to leave. Our kids don't have to go away to school. And certainly if they do go away to school, they, they can come back here and live. And we've really tried to put the emphasis on this about, so downtown, I don't know if you've all, how many of you all been downtown and some of those developments that are going on all around 6th Street down to Broward, you're seeing some pretty awesome developments happening. Those are all targeted to really the young professionals. That 25 to 35 age group that probably looks at it now and says, I don't need to buy a house to start out. I don't know where I want to live. I don't know who I'm going to be living with. I'm not sure what conditions you know, I'm going to be in and, and I, financially, so I'm going to rent. And these are high end, high end rentals that have been incredibly successful in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Related group did one right at the New River, it's what, New River Yacht Club, I believe it's called, right along the Andrews. And I think they had 100 deposits before they ever opened. And you realize what's happening, that the young lawyer, that young doctor, that young nurse, that young professional is saying, I want to be in downtown Fort Lauderdale where it's hopping. And I also encourage, one of the cool things about this is, there is a sensitivity to drinking and driving. And I know that's an odd subject to bring up here, but you are seeing that in our young kids downtown. I was talking to one and they said, you know what? We can go to Second Street, we can go to Los Olas, we can jump on a trolley, we don't have to worry about having to spend a bunch of money on cabs, and we can get everywhere either walking distance or around, and no one has to worry about that they have you know, that third drink instead of you know, that third beer. And it was an interesting concept to talk to them about, and we realized, I commend them for thinking that way, that you know, to have this vibrant downtown, they're not talking about parking and bringing their cars and driving, they're getting around, in and around downtown, they love it. We're excited about that Happiest Cities because my thing is, I keep showing that one to my kids. In fact, I got them a subscription to Forbes magazine. I said, you guys need to see this. But I'm hoping my daughters come back here as young professionals and realize that you don't have to leave Fort Lauderdale anymore. You can stay. Then you got top 100 best cities to start a business. Um, last three, the best places for business and careers, again, Forbes magazine. Uh, next certified uh, as a Florida green local government and the lowest travel taxes. This is an interesting one. Um, despite, you know, you look at our numbers with tourism, 57 straight months, you know, 12 million visitors coming here. You know, we have the lowest travel tax in the country of the 50 largest tr uh, tourism destinations. And it's an interesting thought that that is what, you know, how many of y'all been to Chicago? Right? You check into that hotel, you check out, they told you $1.99 a night and what's your, what's your bill? Like 300, you're going, what is this? 
Well, what it is is Chicago's number one for travel taxes. This is all the stuff they tack on, the convention center tax, the bed tax, the uh, tourist development tax, the rental car tax, the this and the that. And all of a sudden you realize you're, you're paying outrageous taxes wherever you go. Well, that was the other thing we wanted to focus on is to keep it affordable for people to come here. We are actually now ranked the lowest travel tax among the top 50 U.S. travel destinations. So when you look at this, you realize we're in uh, pretty good shape and it goes back to where I started. We're now trying to send a message that we're the city you never want to leave. We're the city that uh, you can come here as a kid, you can stay, you can be raised here, you can go to school here, be educated here, and you can continue here after you retire and come back. You can even be like my mom and dad retiring a couple blocks from their grandkids. So it's pretty cool to have that. And um, on behalf of the city, I really want to thank you all for those rankings. You realize you go through those and there are a lot of cities that would die to have one of those. There are a lot of cities that have struggled to have one of those rankings. And we have, in the last two years, picked up every one of those rankings. And it's because of the leadership in this room. It's because of the leadership and the business community working closely with us. So um, maybe that gives you a little update on how far we've come since 2009. I think we're uh, heading in the right direction. We think that the future is extremely bright here in Fort Lauderdale. And we hope that uh, you're all here for the ride. And that we are in the city you never want to leave. Thank you.